Welcome back. Let's review what we, where we've gone in this series so far. We started off by asking the question, is it legitimate for a Christian to do science? And we said yes, because God has given human beings a mandate to rule this world and to subdue it under his authority. And that involves coming to a deeper knowledge of how it works. So the scientific enterprise is a legitimate extension of the mandate that we have from God in the book of Genesis. I said also that because God is one, and because God is the author of Scripture and the creator of nature, we should not expect conflicts between Scripture and nature. However, we do expect conflicts between science and theology because our interpretation of the world can be mistaken and our interpretation of the Bible can be mistaken. When we encounter these conflicts, what do we do? We study both, because otherwise we don't know where the mistake is being made. It could be we're, we're making mistakes in both cases, in both places. I gave examples of the way that theology has been able to correct uh, science, and science can correct theology. And then I said, let's talk about a specific case, just one case that is a very hot topic today, and that is the age of the earth and the universe. So we dived into that topic. We started by looking at the argument that the universe and the earth are very young, the argument based upon a conservative reading of Genesis chapter 1. We saw that this is in many ways a good argument, in many ways it's persuasive. We also saw that it's not airtight. We saw that there are questions that can be raised, especially about whether we've really correctly understood the genre of Genesis 1. Are we really reading Genesis 1 the way the first readers or the first hearers of Genesis 1 would have understood it? We also then talked about the fact that those who believe that the, that the days of creation must be understood as literal 24-hour days and the creation is a material creation, therefore the universe has to be young, people who take this view find themselves betrayed in some cases into saying things about science that are simply not true. For example, that all scientists who are finding evidence for the age of the earth or universe are really just trying to cover for the evolutionists. That's simply not the case. It's very plain that physicists and astronomers and geologists and others see real evidence that they think is compelling regardless of what they think about evolution. We saw that some theologians are betrayed into saying that uh, sciences like uh, astro astronomy or geology are not real sciences because they're not purely based upon experimentation and that's much too narrow a definition of science. We saw that some also want to argue that because of the fall, our minds are corrupted and therefore we can understand the Bible with the help of the Holy Spirit, but we cannot understand nature. And we said that the, the Bible simply doesn't teach that, and also that experience shows that in fact we can come to accurate knowledge of the world around us, not comprehensive knowledge, but accurate knowledge. Then we looked at the science. We looked at evidence from earth sciences, especially geology, to say that the Earth is old. We talked about uh, various types of rock. We talked about ice layers and so forth. Then we talked about astronomy and physics. And then we said, given the fact that there is this tremendous amount of evidence in the sciences, the natural sciences, for the great age of the Earth and the universe, how do young Earth proponents respond? They respond in two ways, with young Earth science, and I gave my verdict, my, my particular view of young earth science, and they respond with the, the appearance of age argument, which I argued is simply unusable because it charges God with dishonesty. So here we are. How do we resolve this question of the age of the earth and the universe? That's what I want to talk about for a few minutes right now. I think you've got three options. Option number one, you say, I don't know, I'm agnostic. I think this is a legitimate position for many people to take. Life is short. No one has all of the time and energy or ability to think through every single hard issue in life. We all have to determine our priorities, and it may not be a priority for you to wrestle with the interpretation of Genesis 1 or with the scientific evidence for the age of the earth and the universe. And you may prefer to simply say, I'm, I'm just not sure. I think that's fine. I think it's a legitimate way to, to go. I think you just have to be careful then that you are honest about this and you do not allow yourself to be inadvertently co-opted into teaching one view or the other because you're using some kind of a curriculum that takes one perspective, which you may not have a strong opinion is correct. You should be honest with students, especially in the Sunday schools at all ages. If people ask you about this, if you don't know, just say you don't know. Option two is young earth creationism. 
you may say that you feel that the argument from the traditional understanding of Genesis 1 is so clear, so powerful, that it must be true. And you're convinced that sooner or later, scientists will see that that is the case. I think this can be a legitimate position for you to take. Again, I think just some quick warnings. Be sure you don't do this on the basis of really bad arguments. Scientists are just covering for the evolutionists. Science doesn't work because the human mind has fallen. Uh, these are not real sciences. Or the appearance of age argument. These are just bad arguments. They're in, uh, inadmissible and you should not use those. Instead, if you are going to be a young earth proponent, you should say, I believe the Bible teaches this, and I am convinced that with time, science will come around to show that this is true. It may take a long time, but I believe this is going to happen. You should keep an open mind. You should take time to learn uh, other perspectives on Genesis 1. You should take time to look at the scientific questions. Uh, but it's all right to take a stand, for at least for the time being, and say, I believe that the traditional understanding of Genesis 1 as speaking of these days that are just a few thousand years back, which means that then the entire universe is just a few thousand years old, is correct. The third option that you can take, and the one that I take, is to say, we are at another Galileo moment. You remember in the, the Copernican Revolution, what happened was that we thought that the Earth stood still. We thought that on the basis of common sense, the um, philosophy of Aristotle, and the teaching of the Bible, which says the Earth is firmly established, it cannot be moved. And therefore, when the Copernican argument that the Earth goes around the sun began to be expressed, uh, people reacted in horror. There was great difficulty in this. And it took some time for the church to accept the idea that, in fact, the earth does go around the, er, the sun. Well, what did we learn from that? We learned that we had been misreading those texts. And as a result, we have a better understanding of them now, or we can move toward a better understanding of them now than we could before when we were misunderstanding them as speaking of the fixity of the earth relative to the sun, the moon, and uh, other heavenly bodies. We made progress by the fact that science gave us new insight into the reading of the Bible. I think we're at the same place with regard to the age of the earth and the universe. I think that the scientific evidence is overwhelming. I don't think there's any likelihood at all that this is going to change or it's going to be overturned. I don't think it's legitimate to speak of God creating the world with the appearance of age. And so I think that we are at a place where God is giving us a chance to learn more about the world and learn more about the Bible. I think that as we come back to the Bible, with the understanding that we have gained through these modern sciences, we'll ask new questions. And these questions will bring us closer to the understanding of that text that the original writer and the original hearers or readers of that text had. And I believe that some progress, tremendous progress has been made in this direction. I hope to say something about that next time. Now, does my position mean that I'm saying that science trumps the Bible? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I'm saying that scientists can be wrong and theologians can be wrong. We have to look at the evidence on both sides. Am I on a slippery slope if I say that I believe that the universe is old? Does this mean that I am soon going to give up my belief in the literal resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead? Absolutely not. These are very, very different cases. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead is affirmed by all New Testament books and by eyewitness testimony of hundreds of people. It is something that is so central to the teaching of the New Testament that without it, the New, there is no Christian faith. But the interpretation of Genesis 1 that tells us that the universe is young, that's not nearly as central. And it's very possible for us to conclude that we have misread Genesis 1 with regard to the age of the universe without in any way damaging the rest of our faith, just as it was possible for us to give up believing that the sun goes around the earth without in any way damaging the Christian faith. Whatever you decide on this, I encourage you to be charitable toward other people. I think this is an important issue. I care a lot about it. But I do not believe that this is the most important of issues. This is not a first line theological issue. This is not the deity of Christ. This is not the resurrection. This is not the return of Christ. This is not the, the fall of humanity. We're talking here about an issue that is very much secondary. And so let's be gracious toward one another. It's going to take time for the dust to settle on this issue. It's going to take time for people throughout the Christian world to work through this. And we need to talk with one another. We need to be cordial to one another. We should not speak ill of one another. 
God will guide us if we pray and if we do our best and if we remain in communication with one another. Next time I want to come back and finish the series by just talking about what we've learned in general about science, faith, conflicts, and where to go from here. Thank you very much for watching.